Let me start the recording. Hello and welcome everyone to the Be Waste Wise webinar. I am Akanksha Singh. I am the community builder at Be Waste Wise. Uh, and the topic for today's webinar is uh, greenwashing and its impact upon business. Uh, today's session is being uh, moderated by one of UK's uh, leading specialists in circular economy and sustainability in business, Emma Verlo, who is the founder of Lighthouse Sustainability. She's been moderating our webinars for more than two years now. Thank you so much, Emma, for that. And uh, she has worked with businesses on sustainability for over 25 years. And with this experience, she has a unique depth of understanding of the critical success factors for implementing more circular business models. Today, Emma is going to talk to two very renowned and reno learned experts from the industry. Jonathan Rag, an independent packaging consultant who has a strong background in UK and European manufacturing sectors, specializing in sustainable plastic manufacturing. And Heather Davis from Small Footprint Agency, who's working with organizations to communicate sustainability. Uh, before we for proceed further to the discussion, we would request you all to know that this workshop is being recorded and will be uploaded on the Be Waste Wise uh, website and YouTube channel. Please use the chat function for your questions to the panel. Uh, and if you would like to introduce where you're from, which I can see already everybody's doing that. Thank you so much. And who all are joining, joining recently, would, we would request to know where you're from and what, what exactly is there anything that you have to ask, you can definitely have uh, you know a communication with the panel when anytime and uh, use the chat function for that so over to you emma uh, that's so brilliant thank you uh, so it's really really great to see you we've got 82 people in the house which is fantastic i think that's a record for my webinars anyway um so that's really fab and do pop your details in the chat so that we can uh, get to know each other a bit better thanks is just going to pop a, a poll up which is uh, just a way of getting us all all uh, moving this afternoon or whatever time it is where you are. So let's call it out. Should we name and shame greenwashing companies? Go ahead and join the poll. Should we? Shouldn't we? Should we just be helping them quietly? Little, little email, little nudge? Oh, there's no point, frankly. You know, whatever we say, they're just going to carry on. What do we think? So this is a great poll because you can see what's happening as people do it. So 60 people out of 82 have answered so far. Anyone else? So it's looking really clear. Yes, we should call them out. Always and loudly. How do we make progress without that? But actually, no, coming up fast behind. Shouldn't call them out. We should work with them and improve them. If we shame them, we're just gonna send them into the shadows. Green, green shadowing. That'll be the next thing. And Marie says it depends on the company. Fossil fuels, yes. But those have made some genuine mistakes. We should help. Okay, we've got 70 out of 83. Anyone else want to take part in the poll? Jen says it depends on the company as well. If it's a small company who are doing something they think is for the best. Without the knowledge, then we contribute to green hushing. We will come back to green hushing in a bit. So yeah. Okay, I'm going to end the poll there. 63% uh, of you say yes, we should call them out. 27% of them say no, we should work with them. So a little bit split there. So it's a really good time for me to introduce um, my two analysts. I'm so pleased that you've joined me today. Um, Heather and John, do you want to just give us literally 20 seconds on what you do and why you're here today? What, what do you know about greenwashing, Heather? Uh, well, what don't I know about greenwashing? I think um, it's been one of the main focuses of the work that I do, simply because my role is communicating sustainability. And I add a, a parenthesis onto that, which is without greenwashing, because yeah it's unhelpful to everybody in um uh, to companies we're losing trust uh to customers they literally don't know where to turn so the the sort of point of my work is hopefully to communicate sustainability in a way that people can understand it they can make um informed choices brilliant thanks heather great to have you with us so you're definitely working on this from the comms side of things 
and Absolutely. people can make yeah, great informed choices. Really good. Jonathan, how are you coming at this debate? Tell us a bit about what you do. I'm coming at this from the manufacturer's point of view. Um, I've worked for a, a lot of plastic manufacturers out there. I've, I've been all around the world, um, seen all the factories, seen how it's done and, and seen how uh, genuinely how things are made and what is possible and what isn't. Um, so when we're coming at this from a, oh, I want something to be greener, but at the same time, you need to understand end of life as far as I'm concerned. And where I come into this is being independent this past year, um, I tend to put the waste and recycling industry and the manufacturing industry together so that they understand each other around the world so that when they make something, it has a good end of life. So that's where I come at things and that's how I help brands with that really. Um, but I do call out something when it's, it's bad. So I tend to be quite public on that. Brilliant, great. Well, you just summed it up because that's why I invited you both here today because I kind of sit in the middle. So I work with companies on products, I work with them on packaging, I work with them on regulations, I work with them on marketing. And, and it, sometimes it's like never the twain shall meet, right? So the marketing people are saying, well, we've been told by the product people we can say this. And then I'm sort of saying, are you sure? What evidence have you got? So the two tend to bounce back and forward, don't they? And I think, you know, maybe that's what will come out of today. Like, how do we join this up from not just being a marketing problem or not just being a product problem? Because down the middle is the the valley of greenwash death, I think, where people fall, fall foul. So, so let's get started then. And do keep popping your questions in the chat. I'll try and come to them as we go through, or I will definitely come to them at the end if we haven't covered it. Okay. Um, so what is greenwashing and what, what forms can it take? Jonathan, do you want to kick us off from your perspective? What, what are the main forms of greenwashing you're seeing? So the main forms that I deal with are about end of life. They're where somebody is saying a product is 100% recyclable. It is compostable. It is this. It is e eco-friendly. I don't really know what that means. Um, and that's where I kind Therein of... Therein lies the problem. Yeah. E exactly. It's um, the, the term 100% recyclable. Where? I mean, we've had some wonderful people say that in the chat. I know there's one person in this chat and that's at the Buckinghamshire Council. Well, I know that that council is very different to where I live in North East Derbyshire and what I collect. Um, so it's about understanding that and when a, a, a product says that, it's, what does that mean? Um, there's also the other side of it, which is very close to my heart, which is the difference between ocean material and ocean bound and, and ocean plastics. And, and what does that mean as well? Um, and the kind of the gray area of what they are and when does it tip into and, and tip into greenwashing? Um, so that's that's where I feel it. it's a process of falsely conveying environmental credentials. Yeah. So you you mentioned a couple of things then. Definitely claims. Yeah. So what you're claiming, and also source. I think you know where things originate from. So getting back to the nub of the issue, um, I sometimes wonder how many names we can have for plastic that may or may not have reached the ocean. But I'm being uh, I'm being uh, provocative in that statement. Um, Heather, what common forms of greenwashing are you seeing? Well, the main thing is where we're seeing that companies are giving a false impression of the product, service, or even their business as a whole, and they're making it sound a lot more environmentally friendly or less environmentally damaging than they actually are. And from my experience. There's obviously some companies that set out with the agenda of making themselves sound better than they actually are. That obviously falls into the big fat lie category. Um, but on the other side, and I would argue the majority of businesses are accidentally falling into the trap of greenwashing. They are making progress in certain areas and they're starting to talk about that without taking into account the rest of the business or the full life cycle of a product um, and so on. And the other way that they're falling into this trap quite accidentally as well is not by being very specific in the way that they explain what they're doing. So they're using very generic statements. They are um, perhaps provoking more questions than they're actually answering. So an, an example would be, as Jonathan alluded to, maybe like compostable. Well, actually, is that compostable in my home compost or does that have to be comp composted by council in a, in a more um, industrial 
uh, type situation. So yeah, these are the things that, that I'm seeing that people are struggling to understand what the claims are that are being made. Okay, so there's a couple of root things here. Not making claims before you understand what you're talking about. So maybe we'll keep coming back to that. But just to stay with you, Heather, on the kind of marketing comm side, and you touched on it there, is greenwash, greenwashing just bad marketing? Marketers just not doing their job properly? In some respects, it could, you could say it's a bit lazy because if you're, if you're going to put a message out there, you should be really, really confident in that message. You know what's behind it and you're saying something that's truthful and that's backed up. Um, saying, and saying that, though, I think there's just a lot of a, a lack of education, perhaps, around what is OK to say and what's not OK to say. And I think that comes from the fact that we're being bombarded at the moment by um, very vague statements such as sustainable, eco-friendly, earth-friendly, green. So if people see other people using these, then perhaps they're thinking that they're OK to use themselves. Mm, yeah, definitely. And you're starting to touch on some of these terms. So it might be quite nice for people today to understand a few of those terms maybe that we should avoid or maybe would they be red flags so when you look at the content from a company um are there certain terms that jump out at you uh heather do you want to just you reel up a few oh yeah there, but... red red flags for me definitely green sustainable eco-friendly earth-friendly low impact uh, these sorts of things. Those are the real like red flags. Stay away from these. Mm -hmm. And the the terms that I would want people to be aware of and beware is recyclable, as mentioned already, compostable, natural. That's another one because not all you know. You might say a product is natural, but is it how much of it is natural? Which elements of it are natural? How do we define natural? Uh, re made of recycled content. There's actually been uh, quite a lot of research recently saying that uh, products made from recycled content might actually leak more damaging um, elements into the environment than from virgin uh, plastics, for example. So recycled versus uh, mm. versus virgin plastic, I would be wary of that too. Yeah, so it sounds to me, Heather, like marketers are in a, stuck between a rock and a hard place here. So they might want to talk about great stuff. You know, they're yeah. doing their job. That's what they do. They sell benefits, okay? But the minute they get told there's a benefit, somebody says, well, no, it's not really a benefit. You can't, you know, it's not really, you can't say that. So, uh, Jonathan, our market is stuck here. You know, is it the product side of the business, the operation side of the business mm -hmm. that needs to provide the right information first? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I often feel sorry for the marketing team because they their whole job is to follow trends. Their whole job is to promote a product in, in a way that it successfully sells it and, and boosts that product in its image. But at the same time, environmental, environmentalism and sustainability is the trend at this moment in time. So therefore, why would you not try and jump on that bandwagon? The problem is, is that when purchasing teams of, say, brands and products and they're buying products from all over the world, to then fill or, or do whatever they want with it, whether it be plastic, cardboard, aluminium, whatever. They're relying on that. They're, they're not specialists. They're purchasers. Their job is to buy something for the right price that gives that company the right margin whilst making it do the job correctly. The specialists are the manufacturers of that product. Right. So they've got to rely on that information being correct. Now, unfortunately, nobody could expect this, that a manufacturer in say China, they shouldn't have to know every legislation in every single country that they sell that product to. But at the same time, sometimes they're the ones that are making the claims. And I'm not just saying China, but India and Africa and Europe as well, and America and wherever something's made. Sometimes you've got to understand that when a product says it's 100% recyclable, that tends to be in the country that it's manufactured in. Okay. Just, that doesn't identically transfer to, right, we can say our product is 100% recyclable in every country we sell it in. Because it tends not to be. Um, if it's, like Heather said, if it's made from natural resources, well, what is a natural and sustainable resource? I know a, a lot of people jump on, say, the bamboo bandwagon a bit back when it became trendy. But if that really takes off, how sustainable is that? 
because think of the farming equipment, think of the labour intensive, think of the, the actual labour usage in that. Is it adult labour and not child labour? Are they signed up to the Modern Slavery Act? The issue that you've got, especially for brands, is one thing that we cover here is there's no one answer to what is sustainable. It's really actually hard to define what is universally sustainable. Mm. Um, so I, I really do feel for the marketing guys, the purchasing guys. But there's a reason that legislation in countries is coming into play here. There's a reason that you're being asked to prove saying this in the UK especially, obviously the plastic tax came in, but now as of January the 1st, you've got to back those that up with now evidence. You've got to show that your product is made from recycled material and what is in it, and not just a, a material spec from a, a factory that's um, photocopied over and over again. So yeah. I think a lot of companies are going to come across it because they believe in a product that they sell, um, and the evidence just, just won't back that up even though people themselves have it yourself. And there's a lot of other LinkedIn regulars out there that say things. Um, and it's about now backing that up with evidence. And unfortunately, yeah. legislation has to bring that forward. Yeah, and that's what I'm seeing with a couple of my clients, actually. It's not until it gets to the point where they're asked to produce the evidence. And it's almost like Chinese whispers has been really good for five years or 10 years. And actually, when you go back through the supply chain, um, and this is the case I'm dealing with at the moment, is um, is recycled content in a product, they can't prove it, unfortunately. They don't have the documentation to prove it, now, for whatever reason that is. Um, but it's been, um, it, it's been talked about so many years that it's just, you know, it's like taken as read. So it's a really difficult uh, position to get into because it's kind of, well, of course it's recycled. We know it's recycled. Well, how do you know? Um, and this doesn't just, you know, we've, we've sort of started here on the recycling, and I know we've got some questions um, from, from people in the audience as well about that, but this isn't just about recycling. In fact, we shouldn't just dive into that, but, you know, because that's only one element, isn't it? Um, but I just wanted to come back, and I'll come back to carbon, because I think that's a really interesting area here as well about greenwashing. But I just wanted to come back to this, um, the, the legal and other measures that, that are starting to tighten on businesses now. Um, so can, can you tell us, Heather, about um, your experience of some of the codes and um, the legislation that, people, that companies are now having to be aware of? Yeah, so on the consumer side of things, there's now um, something called the Green Claims Code, which has been brought out by the CMA, which is the Competition and Markets Authority. And the Green Claims Code is really guidance for businesses to help consumers to make informed choices. And I think from, well, from what I've seen, it's one of the best um sort of reference reference points that you can go to as a company to make sure that you're towing the line and you're actually being as helpful as possible to the customer and it gives advice uh, that includes um, the need to tell the truth be accurate in your claims be unambiguous uh, make make your comparisons fair and meaningful so that people can understand what you're referring to Think about the full life cycle of your product or service uh, before making any claims. And, and perhaps most importantly, and Jonathan's already touched on this, is to substantiate your claims. So that's, that's the CMA and the Green Claims Code. Um, on the business side of things, we've also got the Advertising Standards Agency. And the Advertising Standards Agency and the CMA actually work quite closely together. But the Advertising Standards is obviously geared at advertising and making sure that businesses are not making false or misleading claims when they're plastering the side of a, a bus or putting a billboard up or uh, launching a, an ad campaign on the television, for example. Yeah, we've seen a few of those. Some people be aware of those, won't they? Um, and that's that's just in the UK. Uh, the the European Union have issued their own guidance, and we're starting to see bodies like the CMA popping up in other well, uh, advice from bodies like the CMA popping up in other countries as well. So, would your advice then be for people to contact obviously their own governments first, find out what the regs are, if they 
don't have anything, they can't find any guidance, then maybe to follow another country's guidance and to follow the EU, would that work? Yeah, absolutely. The EU uh, do have some material online that's available, um, but we were just discussing before the before the, the, the call launched and, um, and you were saying that actually some of your clients in the USA are using the CMI, the CMA guidance, which I find really interesting, but I do believe it is very complete, so I can understand why. Yeah. Yeah, so so hopefully we'll pop a we'll pop a link in the chat for you for the, the Competition and Markets Authority uh, Green Claims Code. For those of you that aren't aware of that, it is very uh, comprehensive. It's a really high bar. Jonathan, I don't know what you think or your experience of the Green Claims Code. Yeah, no, it's it, it's a really high bar. I think when it first came um, out there and it was met quite skeptical. Um, and then bit by bit by bit, they started to raise that bar of what it actually is, what it identified with, because it wasn't just a, a government organization just going down its own path. They had a lot of consultations with a lot of different people from a lot of different areas and a lot, of, especially sustainability, especially. Um, and the same has been done with the, obviously the financial authorities as well and, and in, in the UK. And. I wouldn't say that the UK is leading the way because there's a lot of good work done in the EU and, and Ireland is absolutely fantastic for, for this kind of thing and has been for a long time now. Um, that tends to a lot of friends come from Ireland, actually. They do a lot of good stuff. But with regards to do you want a benchmark, I think the Competition Markets Authority is, is a really good standard there that is being followed. And if businesses start to take that on board with internal frameworks and purchasing and, and legislation and things like that what they can do then th that would actually help a lot um it might not be perfect but it would help a lot yeah great so what that, that's really helpful jonathan a couple of the que questions we're getting through um here are really about the tools that businesses need uh so manta is saying um we need authentic facts that cannot be challenged but are the tools readily available so i've heard you mention lca more than once and i know you know, not everything revolves around an LCA, but for me, the CMA, the Green Claims Code, is a really good, freely accessible tool. Because if you can't answer those questions, you are at risk of greenwashing. It's just as simple as that. Now, what you do after that might require some investment in, you know, investigating the supply chain, audit, even an LCA. But I don't believe, and I'd love to hear your views, I don't believe it's all about the LCA for me. And you, can, you certainly don't need an LCA to avoid greenwash. What are your thoughts on that, Heather? Well, I guess I'd go with honesty is the best policy to start with. And I think that it, it's OK and companies should be owning it when perhaps they either haven't been doing things as sustainably as they might have been in the past or if they're in the process of changing things, for example. And also in terms of communicating what their goals are you know what are they what are they aiming towards um, in in terms of making their their products or their services more sustainable and then what I would encourage is for companies to take their their audience their customers their teams on that journey with them and if you have complete transparency along the process then you can really avoid falling into the the trap of greenwash and the, the added benefit of that is that you generate so much trust and, uh, and admiration for that kind of that real honesty, honest and transparent approach uh, that, you know, people you're going to, I think you only stand to benefit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, Jonathan, what are your thoughts? Another question here is LCA affordable? You know, do we need LCA to avoid greenwashing? I Completely agree. I mean, I think I shook my head hard enough to when I when you said this. I mean, L LCAs are effectively a piece of data, and as we all know, data is only as good as you as you use it once you've been given it. Um, I've seen a lot of companies that spend a lot of money on LCAs, and they only focus on a very specific area that makes them look positive instead of looking at the rest of it. If you're going to do an LCA and you're going to get an LCA, you're going to spend all that money then really do some good and focus on everything. And one of, I think it's all right, because we use obviously a lot of an, acronyms and LCA and life cycle assessment and things like that. I think for me, I, I think a company having a good 
internal framework, a good ESG strategy that shows the business and, and being honest with that. I think one of the best I personally ever seen, and I had absolutely nothing to do with this, was from an international transport company that said, look, this is our stage one, two, and three emissions. We are never going to get to zero because the technology just does not exist right now. The best we can do is a 60% reduction, and it is going to take a long time. However, to get to that, we are going to take our consume, our customers on a journey, and we're also going to look at new technologies and investment and doing this, this, and this all the way along. That's amazing. That is on it. The ones that really get me are the ones that go, right, we're going to be net zero in three years. Oh, we're going to be completely amazing. No. How? It's, it's so hard to do what people perceive is right. And what you're actually finding is, and I know Heather has said this earlier, is it, environmental pressure actually causes mistakes. And that, that actually makes it worse. So you were greenwashing, then you're hiding it, then you're bringing it in, then you're actually making it worse all along the way. Um, the, the, the plastics industry and the packaging industry was, was bad for this in the early stages, say after Blue Planet, because everybody wanted to rush away from plastic as quick as they can to distance themselves. Well, unfortunately, in some cases, plastic is the best product. It, it, it is. It's not perfect. But right now, my laptop's made out of plastic. My, my headphones are. There. There's a lot of things that we're using right now that are made out of plastic, and they're fantastic. Yeah, Sometimes, absolutely. Though. And yeah. then, you know, we, 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 we tend to focus very much on either the packaging or, you know, the plastic, and we forget that there's all these other, you know, things going on. So... One of the most interesting areas of greenwash that I find is where, because there are several ways on there, obviously, to as we've we've covered several ways of sort of tripping up. But the area I'm I'm looking at quite a lot is when you talk very well about one element of your product, but you completely avoid talking about other impacts, any other negative impacts. Um, and so I think that's where Green Planet and, and Blue Planet, I should say. And other things have taken us as a very sort of narrow lens. It's not to say it's not important, but I often say this on my carbon literature training, you know, the plastic that that piece of meat came in is not the issue here, or at least it's not the carbon issue. It might be a different issue. So there's a lot of education to go on here, you know, and going back to whose role is this? I guess like everything, it's everyone's role. So everyone's got to get upskilled to it. Um, and obviously, I've shared a couple of things in the chat about the ASA and the Green Claims Code. So if you haven't um, looked at those yet, they are really good documents. And, you know, run a little workshop with the company. Like, like Heather says, bring everyone along. What, what do people want to know? Oh, sorry, need to know. Um, it is, I think, I don't know if you guys agree, a lot more serious than most companies think. Is that what yeah. you're saying? Some nodding? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's yeah. still not been taken seriously enough. And I wondered if you could share with us um, any examples where greenwashing has really been punished as opposed to just kind of, you know, consumers moaning about it. Are we seeing that now? Is it starting to really bite? Are yeah, de definitely. Uh, one of the most recent high profile cases was HSBC. Uh, mm -hmm. So they, they posted a couple of ads uh, a trillion dollars to help uh, clients transition to net zero yeah. and we're planting two million trees to lock in 1.5 million tons of uh, carbon dioxide well hang on a minute you just forgot to mention about all the fossil fuels companies that you're investing in mm -hmm. so yeah this was a complaint that was sent to the uh, advertising standards agency and uh, which has been upheld so um yeah, really interesting. So in that case, what happens to the company? Heather, are they do they need to remove that advert? Then can they re-edit it and put it out again, or or what happens? You know, uh, they definitely are required to take down the ad straight away. I'm not sure if there's a financial pen penalty or anything like that. Um, well, presumably they'll be losing quite a lot of money in in the advert the 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 money they've spent on advert well, on advertising this in the first place. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
but yeah, a huge mistake. And it's really good that actually it's it's customers that are calling out this stuff. So if you go onto the Advertising Standards Agency website, there's actually a portal where you can report um, environmental or misleading environmental claims. And the same with the CMA. The CMA at the moment are going after the fashion brands. So Boohoo, Asda, and ASOS in particular, who all have eco ranges and um, they're now being required to provide the proof or back up their claims um, because they've been challenged by the CMA. And the CMA is actually appealing to the public for more information from, from their side as well. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Jonathan, are you aware of any other brands that have actually been uh, punished in a way um, for green? Yeah, brands? yeah, I think as well it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like when you, when you talk about punishment, um, it's kind of like when a newspaper writes an article that is wrong and it has to do it and then it has to do a piece to say sorry and the, the main article was the headlines and three pages long and the story is about that big because they've been forced to do it. It's about actually expanding that and focusing on those ones and, and making that small bit actually bigger. So yes, yeah, th there's been some big ones out there, obviously Innocent, Alpro, um, Sainsbury's got done for a thing but tesco also run the same thing and they didn't get done I see. um so yeah and i was i didn't know about that i was recently taught that by a by an organization that i thought i was going to um but when when you earlier when you said something um emma about it's everybody's responsibility i was recently at a formulation summit which is absolutely nothing to do with me as far as i'm concerned i've only ever been involved in the packaging and whether that be hair beauty, whatever, and, and, and selling that or being part of that. But a lot of work goes into what goes into these products, say in the beauty ranges and the products. And I was explaining to them about the packaging laws and, and those guys were absolutely gobsmacked that their company didn't already do this or did this because they have to be vegan friendly. They have to be environmentally sustainable. They've they been doing it for years, you're saying? Yeah, natural products and things like that. And then... What they then do is they hand the packaging over to the other guys. Now, obviously, small brands and things like that don't do that. So it is important that everybody is involved in sustainability because, well, sustainability to a company should be about everything. It's mm -hmm. about everything, not just about the packaging. Mm -hmm. Everything that comes before that, everything that goes after that, uh, what's done with it and the like, how is it used, what's made up with it. And that's really interesting that, actually, the, the more... When I started my career, I was only focused on the outside of something. What go, what went into it never really mattered. It's now about well, actually the whole picture. Mm. And LCA doesn't quite do that. It has to be the company that does that to tailor that. Yeah. Um, so well, yeah, I completely yeah. agree. It's quite cultural in, yeah. the, in the use of words and the use of, you know, terminology, brand. You know, I know we've got a few people here who work in brand that it, it, it's so it's just strong, you know, the, the messaging is so strongly imprinted in the business that if you've been selling those benefits for years, not, even, not necessarily uh, green benefits, but if you've been selling benefits of your products, it's very difficult to say, oh, can't we say that anymore? You know, why, why can't we say it's, it's eco-friendly? Um, so I understand how difficult it is. Um, I'm going to just take a couple of questions from the Q&A. Thank you. There's some, some great questions coming in. Um, Angela Moran says, did you say there was some new legislation coming out in January? Yeah. Jonathan. Yeah, so in, in, in the UK, um, there is EPR, which oh. comes out on January the 1st. It's um, the responsibility, right? There are yeah. Those, yeah, don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, sorry, I've been picked upon this before by our friend, I think it's a friend of all of us, Susan Staff, who said I speak in acronyms too much, so yeah. Right, there you go. Yeah, producer responsibility. Um, and then on top of that as well, um, there is the new changes to the plastic tax, um, where as of the January the 1st, so obviously it started in April, the first quarter was up at the end of June, you just had to declare your numbers. Then it was up again, and, and now it's your six-month time. From now on, at the end of the next quarter, which starts on the 1st of January and has to report in mm -hmm. obviously 13 weeks, then the evidence now has to back that up. Um, the portal will be changing that you, that you report that on, um, as well as the evidence that they take. Now, 
as I said this earlier, I know a lot of companies that are banking of evidence that I know just does not, will not pass guidance because it's a photocopy and it's a carbon copy of the whole thing that they produced and that can't be the case when you talk about 30% recycled material. Yeah, um, it's a whole new world for a lot of companies and I'm seeing it, exactly it the same. And also yeah. it's coming at quite speed, you know, it's coming at quite high speed and I think the guidance um, for some elements hasn't still hasn't been finalised and all that sort of thing. So, so I think we have to grasp the fact that this is coming at us at high speed, that it is really serious, that companies are getting um, you know, punished for it. A few more people were saying here, there's a few companies who claimed 100% recycled content for their bottles, but they forgot to mention the cap on the label. Um, there's one in the chat here. Um, sorry, I have to move this. H&M had to take down their conscious labeling uh, brands based on a court ruling in the Netherlands. So there are, there's too many examples now, really, for this to be ignored. And I know these are big brand names, um, but one of the other questions we've had here is, you know, does this apply to small and medium companies as well? Um, you know, is greenwashing just a corporate thing or are you seeing it in uh, SMEs as well? Sorry, you're asking me or Heather? Sorry, I'm going to ask Heather. I think it's something for, for every company to bear in mind. I mean, at the end of the day, I think what we need to get to, the sort of utopia, is where where businesses and, and all organisations really look at things through a sustainability lens. You know, we're, we're, we're on a finite planet. We cannot continue to, to extract and consume in the way that we currently do. Everybody needs to be looking at this through a sustainability lens. And I don't know about you, but I think I find it easier to trust the smaller brands because I feel like perhaps, you know, they can be more honest and transparent and take me along with them for their on the journey. And I think actually maybe some of the bigger brands need to learn from some of the smaller ones. Yeah, great idea. Yeah, that's really good. And just sticking with this truth and honesty piece, because this seems to be coming out, doesn't it? And um I, I'm a bit facetious with one, one of my clients and that, you know they've asked me so many times um, and I get on very well with them. We work very openly. Um, oh, can we say this? Can we say that? And I say, look, guys, if you're not telling lies, it's probably going to be OK. You know, and they go, <laughs> oh, oh, well, it's not really a lie, is it? Like, is it a white lie? Might be a white lie. Well, we don't really know. Well, there's your problem. So then we go back, you know, so the truth test, I think, is really important. And how, you know, how do you know something is true when you have facts? to back it up so if you don't have back to back it up is it just hearsay you know and that's going back to your point Jonathan um so there's a question here from from John uh, Langan um we might not know this brand I don't know but is the Norona swing tag with a checklist of sustainable features an example of greenwashing or is this an open and honest communication I don't know if either of you know of that one a swing tag or no, sounds like a fashion sure. brand so if you just list, if you just list your um, sustainable features, good stuff going on in your brand, is that greenwash or is that open and honest communication? Heather, go ahead. This is a comms one. I think I think uh, I think that's one to be wary of. Um, I think I think communications. Well, it depends, really. I suppose one of the one of the things that the Green Claims Code does say is that if you're making claims on your label, so for example, if you're talking about the things that you're doing well, uh, because obviously a label on a product or a, or a, at the end of a rail or something like that, you can't necessarily fit loads of information on. Mm -hmm. But what you should be doing is making information available within just one or two clicks. So that could be a QR code or a simple link to a website that people can click and go through and find a more complete, um, well, the more complete story, basically. So that's something that I definitely encourage companies to do. I think it is okay to talk about the things that you're doing well, but you know, you need to be transparent. Yeah, great. No, that's good. And just um, just taking that one step further, I think, Jonathan, with your knowledge about recycled content in product, you know, when is enough enough? You know, how much recycled content in a product do you think is enough to label something as recycled? What what sort of terminology should we be using around those things? You know, how do we define these sustainability impacts? Yeah, I, I think a lot of people also get hung up on recycled 
more than recyclability. Right. It's okay something being made out of recyclable material. However, if at the end of life it's just going straight to incineration mm -hmm. or landfill, then ultimately, okay, what are you what are you really doing? I mean, really, if you're not looking at the whole picture, because end of life has to be an end the real focus here about mm -hmm. improving the end of life. Okay. Like Heather touched on earlier, we have a finite, a finite, finite, a finite planet. We only have finite resources. So if we're just literally doing the whole linear economy, but making it out of recycled material, well, is that any better? It makes you feel better. But it's, so it's, it's actually, on the less bad pile. That's where yeah, I'm like that. Yeah, it's on the less bad pile. <laughs> However, I, I think it's a case of look, the plastic tech started at 30%. Right. We know that aluminium products often brag that the stats about how much has always been mined or during its existence and it's infinitely recyclable and things like that and then cardboard and, and great stuff. But ultimately there's, there's a lot of other things that go into that. You've touched on carbon, Emma. You, Helen, yeah. you've touched on legislation when it comes to what is actually being said about that product. So sometimes it's, it's not just about what's the product is made from because not all products can contain recycled material they, they can't as heather said earlier unfortunately we find in some products that some that use recycled material and the, we will stress the some here it's been found that some in certain circumstances in the food grade the grade of the recycled material isn't up to standard as much as the virgin is so therefore it's leaking things in to certain products we have those products are being recalled it's, it's quite public we're not instantly saying that if a product contains recycled material it's bad it's not as good as virgin we're not but once again it's not a one size fits all answer to sustainability so is it good that it contains recycled products yes if it can and it doesn't alter the product's nature or its ability to be recycled. Be end recycled. Of life. So this end of life thing is really important. And that's really important to me because the carbon piece has kind of smashed into the circular economy piece at high speed, hasn't it? So yeah. let's just uh, let's just concentrate on that for a, for a minute, because we're seeing this massive explosion now of, of uh, um, net zero, you know, uh, commitments and claims, everything from I think the soonest one I've seen is 2029, so not even 2030. Um, and that I did, I was so shocked by it that I actually organized the call with the company because I was like, I have no idea how you're doing this. And if you are, I'm really impressed, you know, they've got a really solid plan, but it turns out that, you know, parts of their business, they put boundaries around because they specify, you know, that the work is specified by somebody and all those sorts of things. So there are always, there's always devil in the detail. I think the most important thing for me, I'm afraid to say, is that little star that takes you off somewhere, a little link that says, this is our target, but go and see why we've made, how we think we're going to achieve this. So maybe there's something there. Maybe the swing tag that was mentioned here is just too small. You just can't get enough information on it. Heather, is that part of the problem? You, you greenwash because you can't say enough in some respects. I, I think that, that companies are getting wise to using tactics like that. Um, and I think it's I think it's really important, especially when it comes to when it comes to carbon, because it's not something that's very widely understood necessarily. Um, hopefully it's going to go that way uh, we're starting to see carbon labeling on certain products the only trouble is that people don't necessarily know how to compare or don't have enough information to compare like for like products um, and i think that for me um, sort of uh, brings us quite nicely onto another point which is about education and i think it's not just educating the companies um, to communicate correctly about the claims that they're making, but it's also um, educating the public at large in terms of how to how to understand and how to spot greenwashing, because it's really hard if you're just if you, you know if you're a mum and you've got three kids or, or a dad and you're on the weekly shop and you're like ah, which of these should I choose and one's <clears throat> recycled packaging and one's this and one comes from one's one's farmed here and there and 
it's um it's yeah. really hard to make those on the moment uh take those on the moment decisions and it feels like you're taking decisions every step of the of your supermarket shop or every time you want to buy a new top or whatever it might be it's constant decision making and it's it's really tiring people are really are getting quite yeah. tired of it so i think educating people helping them understand what to look for but also educating people about what what carbon what you know what's a normal carbon um emissions figure that would go with buying a yeah. jumper or yeah. buying an apple or whatever it might yeah. be yeah i think that's so in, so interesting and, and it worries me now they're going to come to a couple of questions here about carbon labeling or labeling at all you know some things i i, I wish were labeled i wish food was labeled if it was air freighted for example yes or no I don't even care about its footprint. I just want to know with a red or a green, like, you know, so simple things for that. But we seem to be going down a very complex route. Um, and it struck me when you were talking there that this is an in immature su subject. You yeah. Know, a bit like carbon maybe 10 years ago or 15 years ago. We're just all trying to learn very quickly. Um, and, you know, the, the, one of the questions here is, is there a danger of confusion? Uh, definitely with all the different agencies and that sort of thing. Um, and do we think that there's a risk with all this potential confusion and fines and also scepticism from, from consumers that, that people could actually do less? So let's bring in this term green hushing. So are you starting to see this where people are going, do you know what, this is just too hard. Do you know, we're just not going to say anything. Because I know from the brands that I work with, getting complaints is probably, you know, the worst thing that can happen it drives everybody running to the hill you know what we're going to do about it we're getting complaints so it's very costly for brand as well i think as someone said so green hushing jonathan is that something you've come across uh yeah 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 i think it's a if we don't well this is now frightened to say something which which was always actually going to happen because you you said that actually the, the 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 knowledge of sustainability within nearly every organisation out there is actually really limited and oh, really yeah. small. Yeah, I think this um, is a problem. Mm. Yeah, it, yeah, it's incredibly small. So it was always going to be a case of it. I, I think what is happening though behind the scenes, and we're talking about green hushing. And you asked the question earlier: is it is it better to trust a small brand to a big brand? I think just one thing on that is it's really hard for a big international brand to change overnight. They, yeah. they can't do that. It has to take time. However, because of green hushing, what they're not doing is telling people how long it's going to take them to do something. So and I'm not going to name brands, but say a drink, an international drinks company. If they want to be more sustainable because they're getting a lot of bashing at this moment in time, well, I'm not seeing them come out and say, look, this is where we want to be. Just so you know, this is it's going to cost billions. It's 10 years. Yeah, it's going to cost billions, guys. And we are not there yet. It's took us, we've been going since the 50s and earlier. We are where we are. I, we know, wanted, I know who you're talking about now, Jonathan. I'm not naming them. I'm not getting a lawsuit. But effectively, <laughs> and I'm not saying that they're good guys, but what I'm saying is it's got to be, you can't keep pounding and pounding and pounding and saying, look, dude, change now, change now, change now, because well, all that's doing is causing them to go, well, I'm not going to talk about anything. then. <laughs> and actually, there are parts of those organisations, whether it's your big beauty brands, your drinks brands, whoever, mm -hmm. who actually do some good yeah, in community. I totally agree. Yeah, yeah there's a good the, practice the, out there. Yeah, it's yeah. good practice. And, and, and maybe we can sort of come to that as we come to, I can't believe the time, actually. We've really come into the top of the hour. Um, but a, a question here from Sean. Hi, Sean. Sean's been a previous panellist uh, for us at Be Waves Prize. So, um, you know, what sort of information, what tips would you give, um, you know, companies from the biggest companies that you're talking to, Jonathan, to some of the smaller uh, companies, you know, where to start on this topic? I mean, some people might be joining us today going, oh, man, this just sounds like a nightmare. You know, what, what tips do you sort of start with, Heather? Well, I think going back to the original tip was sort of be honest, be transparent tell people where you are in your journey, tell people what your aspirations are and the, and explain how you're going to get there. Because there's no point setting a target if you don't actually have a plan that's going to help you get there and 
you know, and it's, um, and that's, that's greenwash, basically, set a target, don't tell anyone what you're going to do, you may or may not reach it, nobody will ever know, but the target looks good, you know, mm -hmm. so um, I would be, I would be truthful, I would make sure that you are unambiguous in what you say, and there's an easy way to, uh, to test that, is literally to write whatever it is that you're that you want to communicate and test it with people get them to read it do they understand does it raise more questions than it answers mm. and, and that's something that I use a lot you know if I've read something and I've got more questions at the end of what I've read than when I started then that's greenwash because you haven't provided me uh, with enough information for me to make a, a, a decision an informed decision yeah, that's really good. So Sean's question, actually, I misread it a bit, was any tips to spot greenwash? So what you've given us there is both, if you can spot it, then the company needs to be able to solve it. But they can test yeah. that yeah. on their consumers. I, I bought some yeah. tea bags recently and I and I won't name the company, but I did post it on LinkedIn. And I was like, I don't think I did name them, partly because they weren't taggable. So um, and partly because I just emailed them quietly um, because I just thought this is just this has got to just be a mistake. They can't have done this. <laughs> So they've written 100% biodegradable all over the packaging, which was cardboard. You know, we could debate all day whether that's biodegradable or not. Um, probably not because it's, you know, got inks and all the rest of it. Um, or at least I wouldn't put it in my compost bin, put it that way. But the important point I'm trying to get to was the bags, which is, I think, what they were trying to say was 100% biodegradable, were in a foil plastic bag with 100% biodegradable stamped all over it. So for me, had they just said these tea bags are 100% biodegradable, I'd have been like, hooray, but they missed out some fundamental bits. So there's something here yeah. for me about just missing out key words that educate people, key instructions, Jonathan, on how to recycle things, as opposed to just throw away statements about, you know, it is recyclable, if you're lucky enough to live in the one place that does recycle it. Or, or whatever. Um, so tips then to wrap up with Jonathan, tips to spot greenwash and tips maybe for companies to avoid greenwashing. I think tips to avoid greenwashing is, Heather just said it perfectly, it's look internally. Right. What you're finding is more and more staff are more and more becoming more and more educated in the fact. <laughs> It has to be an environmental scope and the sustainability scope of the brand has to have a bit of every little division in it. It has to have purchasing, logistics, marketing, every little bit in it. And then it has to be seen and it has to be run by that. Because if internally your staff don't believe in your product, you will lose those staff. But not only that, you will lose your customers as well because you're not in line to them, you're lying to your brand and lying to everybody. So look internally. As for a consumer, what can a consumer more it well, does this stack up? Does look at it? What does eco friendly mean against what? What what does green actually mean? And we know that consumers want to be more sustainable. They do. Obviously, the cost of living crisis is putting a a stamp on some of that. So it's now down to those brands that are at a lower level to to get on that and be more recyclable. Mm. And obviously, legislation is attacking those from that side of it. But effectively, from a consumer level, it's, it's hard with clothing. I can't speak for clothing as, as such because that's not my industry. But when I buy clothing, I buy clothing to last. Simple as that. I want it to last. I don't want to replace it in six months' time. So it has to stay moved away from that. And it's another product. Once I've used it, what happens to it? What bin do I put it in in the local authority where I live? Is it really understand? And that's just in the UK, obviously, but... No matter what country you're in, in, this is what it's saying about where it's been from, what it's made from, and things like that. But what bin do I put in? That's that's effectively the best you can do as a consumer is understand that. Yeah. And brands need to know that more. Yeah. So a term we haven't mentioned today, we're back on recycling. And try as I might, pull us away. Sorry. Wish cycling. You know, yeah. recyclable. Oh, great! It's recyclable. You know, the word wish. You know, wishful thinking really. And I sometimes say to people, in fact, I had an inquiry yesterday about a product uh, with you know, three different parts. Can we say it's recyclable? And I just, I just said that there aren't any elves taking these things apart at the, at the, 
<laughs> at the recycling shed, you know, unless that isn't that isn't really obvious to the consumer that you want them to take that off and peel that one, you know, it's not going to happen. So um, yeah, so so a couple of things to take away there. So wish something, wish don't wish it, don't wish it will happen. Prove it will happen or can happen or is happening, um, and be really transparent about it. I've got one question here that I want to wrap up on, and I, you know, I'm going to apologise it now because it's a toughie. Uh, but from Randy, um, how is greenwashing different from every company calling themselves the best? You know, marketeers sell benefits, don't they? Oh yeah, that's a tough one, isn't it? Really good question. This is I like think... a whole new era of marketing for me. You know, I think we've been able to say we're the best for years. Go on, but it's more quantifiable. I think greenwashing is more quantifiable. If you're greenwashing, there's some serious bits of information that are missing. And that could be, as we said, the sort of ambiguous statement, or it could be the 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 evidence to back up your claim. Um yeah. Jonathan, any thoughts on that? Bragging. Yeah, I, yeah, I think the whole best thing is subjective anyway to personal opinion, unless a company's got a stat to show and you can see that in TV adverts, don't you? Say, tested out of one out of five people. One in five people, yes. but they've only tested five people. If you look at the little words at the bottom. Um, but actually, environmental credentials is now quantifiable. You can, you can say, well, is it 100% recyclable? It, we've gone to recyclable. Is it biodegradable? If so, how easy is it? When, how easy is it for the consumer to understand exactly what, what they think they're buying is what they're buying? Yeah. Um, and that, so that's overnight then, a seemingly brands um, have sleepwalked them into this position, themselves into this position where they're educators as well. So not only are they selling us something, but they have to educate us how, you know, why it's more sustainable than X, why it's a better product. I mean, really fascinating to, to work through that with you. And I'm sorry, there's so many more questions that people have got here. But all I would say in the last kind of minute or so, um, do uh, get in touch on LinkedIn. I know Heather and Jonathan would both be happy to answer questions. Um, I've tried to cover as many as I can, but obviously there's some detail in there that people have got questions on. Uh, for example, the comment you made, Heather, I think about the recycled plastic, if there's any resource, any reference to that. Um, and yeah. other people have asked here about, um, oh gosh, the good old favourite, the plastic bag versus the cotton bag. Um, one thing I'm going to leave it with, and it's because of my circular economy roots, we haven't talked much about this today, but we, we still focus in heavy on linear economy. So I think we, we should call more people out on, on, you know, this isn't just about linear, that this isn't just about my product is made of this, how great is it? I want to know how I can repair it. I want to know how you're going to take it back. So I'm going to leave you with that in terms of uh, the challenge. Calling out greenwash is great, but I think we should be pushing companies to actually go, you know, the trainers is the classic one for me. I couldn't care less if the trainers were 100% recycled foam. If they're going to last a week and go in the bin, you know. So, uh, yeah, any final words from you, Jonathan, as we close? No, all, all I say to anybody that I work with is, is that if you are better tomorrow than you were yesterday, then you are becoming sustainable. But please don't tell me that you're going to be net zero tomorrow when you're when you're terrible yesterday. So because be that's honest. not it. Yeah, it's, it's just a huge about challenge, right? Yeah, it's yeah. okay to say this is really hard. Yeah, marginal gains and just get to where you want to be, but understand how that's going to happen. Yeah. is my last takeaway really. exactly heather any final words from you yeah my final words would be to really put yourselves in the shoes of your customer yeah. and try and understand from their point of view if they will be able to understand what what claims you're making and whether they'll be able to make an informed choice based on what you're saying. And if you can't put yourselves in your customer's shoes, because it is very difficult when you have so much knowledge of the business itself, uh, test it, test it on other people before you put it out there. I think that's been my big takeaway from today. This is really confusing and it's really hard, but guess what? There's only you and your consumer and you're a partnership. So it's got to work for you. So it'll only be sustainable if you know what they want and if they know what you can, you, you know, what, what you can deliver. So I think, you know, Heather, um, you're, you're right. Jonathan, you're right about looking internally. They really, we really need to join departments together. 
and Heather, we really need to communicate better with our consumers and understand what they do with our staff uh, when, when, yeah. when they get it. I could go on for another half an hour, guys, but uh, we've got to let all these lovely people go back to their, back to their jobs. So thank you, everyone. Um, share the recording if, if you've had to, you know, if you've had to leave or uh, you've got others who think you'll enjoy it. And do uh, track us down on LinkedIn and be happy to answer any further questions. Brilliant. Thanks Great. very much, Emma. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your interaction. Really, really thank you for uh, all the participants to be is so interactive with their questions. And uh, we would definitely be uh, able to, uh, you know, post these questions and queries to the, the panel and then they'll be able to take it up. And obviously, as Emma said, that we can obviously take, uh, you can always uh, get in touch with them on their LinkedIn profiles. Uh, before we uh, close this, I would request if, uh, that, uh, you know, this recording will be shared on our website and also on our YouTube channel. So, and, and for any other uh, future events, uh, we would request everybody to subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on social media. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Ida. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks, and thank everyone. you, everybody. Thank you. Muchas gracias.